I've known Adam for probably 10, 12 years at this point. Uh, we've been kind of loosely working together through many areas of uh, science and technology acceleration. Um, we bonded early on in uh, realizing that the um, way in which science was proceeding and the way in which that science was getting translated into devices and technologies and then eventually getting into products and mass market adoption, um, which is sort of completely and utterly broken um, and going extremely slowly. Um, and there are some uh, extremely difficult uh, incentive field questions there, both within the kind of academic environment with um, academic credit and reputation being awarded to say like conceptual results, but not really getting the results into um, close to development and close to um, you know, any kind of production. Um, and separately on the market side of kind of this um, uh, almost kind of both long-term irrational um, and, and borderline crazy or actually are maybe definitely crazy way of valuing um, things where certain you know, critical developments for humanity um, are totally uh, not, uh, not invested in or totally undervalued relative to maybe really uh, glitzy and shiny short-term things. Um, leading to kind of like this massive macro misallocation of resources where um, the macro environments are funding large scale um, kind of short term things um, instead of like funding extremely valuable long term uh, oriented projects. So um, uh, Adam and I have been like um, over many years working in many different areas, um, many diff helping many different groups and projects and so on. I've been um, just so thoroughly amazed to see Adam's work um, come to fruition in so many different fields. Um, at the heart of um, everything in neurotech, um, everything related to VCI and so on, but also um, uh, neuroimaging and in many um, other areas at the forefront of computing, uh, you can see sort of Adam's um, work and touching and, and helping so many teams out there. And one of the things that, that I admire greatly about Adam is that um, he's been supporting and connecting many groups for, for you know, a decade and a half now. Um, and many groups either exist because Adam connected people to then help them start it, or they exist be, uh, and, and are support, because Adam helped them find support. Um, and this is now kicking off to a whole new um, scale of, of uh, success with uh, the recent um, uh, invention of the new model for uh, FROs, Focus Research Organizations, uh, which we'll hear a little bit about. Um, and that's working and scaling, which is super exciting to hear and see. Um, and you know, I really think if we kind of end up producing um, uh, solid neurotech in the in the next um, in the next few decade or two, it'll be great in part thanks to you, thanks to you, Adam, and all of the work that you've been chipping away at for you know a couple of decades. So thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you for joining us and speaking with um, uh, with us tonight. Um, have a bunch of like uh, questions around BCI and the field and road mapping and FROs and kind of like how you think that this might develop and what should we be focusing on now. But yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, super happy to be here. Yeah. Great. So let's let's dive in. Dive in. So um, early on, um, we aligned on the concept of road mapping and tech trees and helping humanity kind of think ahead to um, a field and how, what are the roadblocks in that field and how to identify them and so on. Can you maybe like, um, how, how's your thinking evolved over this? Like, um, is that still like really important or do you see it getting better? Uh, maybe start by like helping us uh, understand kind of what you mean by roadmaps and tech trees and, and so on. Yeah, it's it's a slightly complicated set of set of things because in some ways the idea of a roadmap and it, when we come back to it, the idea of a FRO, is that these are sort of very obvious things. It's sort of like if, if aliens came and, you know, started doing science, you know, on Earth, you know, these these would just be so, so obvious. And there's there's been periods of time and fields, you know, air, you know, aerospace in the 1960s or something where where this idea of road mapping is just completely obvious to everyone. So there, there's not really any rocket science, <laughs> I guess, to to the idea of road mapping. Um, but I think what one of the things that is is worth pointing out and we'll kind of come back to is the way in which science is structured is not necessarily structured to optimize for any given kind of long range outcome, like how do we achieve brain computer interface that's really scalable or something like that. Um, it's, it's optimized as a kind of self-organizing system of various actors. And within that system, there are certain activities that are more or less incentivized. Um, and in particular, you know, in, in the, the kind of company setting, um, you know, you have maybe roadmaps at some level within one company around what, what, what does a corporation need to do to, to develop products and capture value. Um, but, uh, less so a kind of 
field wide, you know, uh, de dependency graph of different pieces of the technology, different pieces of science as well, that uh, are needed to unlock some goal, right? So if you, if you just think about working backwards from some some goal, looking at all possible kind of technological pathways, what are the scientific risk points? What are the right ways to address each of those? How do they depend on each other? That's that's the idea of a roadmap. It's also very much the idea of a a kind of tech tech tree is that there there are certain uh, technologies that would uh, unlock uh, many other capabilities. There are sort of very very root level capabilities like lithography, you know, for computer chips unlocks everything that we're we're talking about here. Um, you can think about what it was that that unlocked lithography and so on. Um, but but in in the industry setting, you know, there's kind of you go and pitch VCs and you have a certain you know product roadmap, but you don't necessarily have that field wide roadmap. And the academic setting, um, you know, Michael Nielsen has this really great paper. I think the, the idea of roadmaps is a subset of this idea of like vision papers or kind of strategy papers. And that that type of activity, um, it doesn't fit in the kind of novelty as fields evolve and it's very natural. Um, people get rewarded, not just for sort of having some general idea of how things should go and what, what the strategy that other people should take, but making some definite, you know, incremental contribution that can be verified immediately by reviewers and say, yes, you, you did this and it advances something in a certain way. So there's certain kinds of papers and certain kinds of activities that are both bite-sized enough for an individual person to get credit for in, in their research, um, pay off in a certain frame of time, are verifiable and reviewable in a certain way. Um, that leads to kind of research contribution and making the text tree is not necessarily a research contribution uh, in that setting, even though it's very important um, at the system level. Do, do you think, um, we, we talked in the past about how so much of this knowledge is, exists latent in, in the minds of scientists and engineers and, um, and, and developers in a bunch of different places. Do you think that that's getting better now that you know, the number of papers has scaling basically close to exponentially and um, it's just getting so difficult to like follow the fields and um, there's so much convergent um, or simultaneous invention in d different places. Um, are, are you getting a sense of, is that still a case that a lot of this knowledge is trapped or do you think it's getting closer to it being diffused into the internet in some way, um, now just maybe needing to be interlinked and, and, and organized? I think these things relate in the sense that as we kind of unblock people, if you imagine giving someone a fellowship to do road mapping in a certain field, or Tom Khalil and other people have started using the term field strategist uh, for that, that road mapping role, um, then because there is so much on the internet, I, mean, I think the types of things that I've done um, are just wholly reliant on Google Scholar and, and, and the internet and the ability to do, to do search and the ability to kind of rapidly fire off an email to you know the world expert on something, get a critique of something. So I think in many ways it is getting much more possible and the, the type of things that we're doing, you know, road mapping BCI technologies, that would have been very, very hard to do. And also some of the serendipitous discoveries and kind of merging of fields is very much enabled by that. Um, I still think we're not necessarily taking advantage of it enough. And because again, it's often done as kind of along the way, kind of along the side, you know, you have researchers that are searching Google Scholar, they're finding things, they're, they're understanding what's out there. I'm, the example Millen gave of optogenetics is also one that, that we've talked about in, in some of these questions about what's the digital systems that, that support this, where optogenetics really r relied on um, understanding that there are certain types of kind of photosynthetic proteins and microbes. If you could bring that into neuroscience, um, you could express those in neurons potentially. That would be really transformative for neuroscience for the following reasons, because light would be better than electrodes for certain reasons. Here is what you would need to do to test and set out that experiment, who's who you would contact, what the team would look like that could do that experiment. And they kind of stitched it together um, very rapidly how to do that. Um, but that took a kind of extraordinary focus. And many, many of the people were in a kind of very special configuration. They had special fellowships that were letting them do that. They had been trained in a special way and they had a very special orientation. And so there, there isn't really something that um, deliberately tries to optimize the probability of such events happening. It's something that is a, a very special case to have that kind of cross-disciplinary uh, synthesis or kind of moving of tools from one discipline to another. I think that there might be ways that we could accelerate that with better tools um, for capturing that tacit knowledge. And certainly that's true at the level of things like experimental protocols and kind of details of experiments, reproducibility. Um, we, again, the system hasn't really 
kind of goal-directed effort to optimize for that if these are tools that are kind of being used along the side of people's day-to-day -day, um, day jobs. Can you tell us a bit about um, how the FROs are going? Um, you know, how, how, did, how has the reception been so far? Um, is the model work, what's working about the model? Um, what scale are you hitting and, and so on? Yeah. Well, we have uh, three that exist right now um, that have been funded um, and that have labs and are, are, are doing, doing operations. Um, two of those are within our meta nonprofit kind of incubator structure called Convergent Research. Um, so those have two labs operating. We, we, we basically started this over about the past year. Um, we now have a, a separate nonprofit um, that is kind of the incubator for these. And uh, we have several more that are sort of passing a review phase and likely to launch in early 2023. Um, those are in the biomedical area still um, in very, various sort of parts of, of bio. Um, and I'm very excited, uh, even just in the last six months, I, I think we've started to see at the ideas level, um, people kind of endogenously picking up this concept and coming to us with things that fit the FRO model. So, so much as uh, in, in, the, in brain and brain sciences, there are a lot of these kind of scalable measurement problems or kind of scalable interfacing measurement slash control perturbation. Um, that look like engineering, they look like large team, you know, har hardware integrated system engineering and scale, um, not just like kind of individualized discovery. And those are needed even to do the basic fund very fundamental things in neuroscience, but there's not necessarily a mechanism to unlock that. Um, we're starting to see examples of that. I think climate, we have three climate related proposals right now that have just come in in the last six months um, that are all on this idea of sort of scalable integrated measurement of climate variables. And what if we could just put all the different types of sensing in one uh, platform so that you can actually have a high dimensional measurement as opposed to lots of disconnected low dimensional measurements. Um, and so we're starting to see traction, I think, at the ideas level. And we're, we're trying to be very stringent about it, right? So anything that really can be a traditional VC backed company or even a kind of long range VC backed company and anything that can be done with a traditional granting mechanism uh, to universities or other types of institutions, we're really trying to rigorously avoid that. So like in, there are a lot of things just in that climate example, um, you know, fusion reactors that has might have been, it's, it's a big difficult research thing, um, but it is something where the VC world is now like really driving that. So we're not looking at fusion reactors. That's ultimately a kind of private good as a product um, that, uh, that, 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 that fusion reactor, you can capture value, but something like the underlying data of material science that supports fusion reactors or the underlying measurement of what is actually the dynamics of the climate system that says, are we going to need to do different types of interventions? Those are things that look more like uh, systems engineering, but in service of public goods. Um, and uh, that's, we, we've been seeing traction on that in the FROs. Um, you know, another thing that's been exciting is that the, the first projects that exist have had some significant success in hiring really fantastic scientists. And one of the, the first questions that always comes up is, well, these things don't offer kind of equity in a high growth you know, company. Um, they also don't offer the sort of security of, of the academic path with the possibility of tenure and so on. Um, and they raise a lot of questions. You know, The team is going to have to design for themselves. What is it that comes next? And they have to work with us also to sort of put guardrails around that and understand what the best public benefit path is for that. But they're basically going to have to design um, de novo, a kind of career path of what, what comes out of the, for, for them out of the fro and what comes out of the technology for impact. And so the, a lot of the question about FROs has been, uh, can we hire amazing people? <laughs> and the answer is yes, we can hire amazing people. So I'm really excited about that. The first two teams have, have had a really, really done a really great job recruiting and we're starting to see, um, you know, they're, they're both doing uh, serious work on the ground. Yeah. What's the scale of like the teams and the funding and so on? If you could say. Um... Yeah, um, they're, they're, they're usually, um, this, their scope, the mental model of it is really, um, the idea is sort of modeled on like a series A biotech startup, something, something like that. So, so it's, it's not meant to be thousands and thousands of people, billions of dollars at the, at the scale where an entire field sort of has to agree on something. It's meant to be still these relatively agile teams. Um, but what you'd be surprised is that even getting, you know, 
three or four or five people in the traditional academic setting to really be truly rowing in the same direction, truly that kind of specialization of labor and tight integration that you'd see in a product development team in a company. Uh, you can't do that in in other settings, and so, so even a team of fifteen or twenty people, which is where I think I think these these first two projects probably are going to kind of asymptote maybe around twenty something people uh, each um, over five years. That uh, that tight knit integration that still leads to a totally different method of product uh, sort of project management and how people coordinate and how how you how you hire how you manage the team. Um, so what, what that works out to, if you add lab space and equipment, is sort of on the order of five to ten million a year for for five years. So it's roughly like sort of thirty to fifty million dollar projects uh, per project. Yeah. Yeah, per project. And you know, I think if you, how, how many such projects do you need in a field? Is it something on the order of like thirty to thirty to fifty, or do you think like even ten projects could make a massive? Yeah, it's a really great question. Yeah, because I mean, this again comes back to these FRO shaped bottlenecks sort of what are, what are, what are this particular bottlenecks that then there's so many things that you can do as companies um, and that where it will make sense to use different structures. But, but my, my guess is uh, it's kind of like more like three to five FROs per like major kind of macro fields. You know, I think in neuroscience, we should have one on human brain uh, interfacing as you were just talking about with Millen. We should have one, and we do have one uh, E11 bio on the structural molecular circuit mapping. We should have one on activity mapping. Um, there's probably a couple others, um, but it's kind of like three to five kind of core data generating um, discovery platforms, if you want, that then uh, can spin off lots and lots of things where once we kind of understand some science from that and this science is accelerated and also you accelerate the very, you know, the thousands of researchers that are working in the more academic structures, um, then. But, but is that is uh, that number just um, coming from the constraints on the funding side, meaning like, hey, you only can afford to fund a certain number of these, so then you kind of like round robin it across fields? Like if you could... I don't know, organize all of the R&D funding of the US or, or um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I actually don't think that you need thousands and thousands of FROs, to be, to be honest. I, great. I think that That's we're still news. far from having five FROs per field in terms of our available and sort of the speed at which we can allocate that, that funding and access that funding. Um, so we definitely need a lot more, a lot more funding. But um, I, I actually really think that we need to be very careful. Sort of, the FRO shouldn't be everything, right? There's many. It, it, it is a kind of special leap, right? And there is something that that's maybe inherently uh, more scalable about funding lots of fellowships and lots of trainees and 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 sort of individual groups in a more distributed fashion, right? You don't necessarily need to put everything to be an FRO. And so there there are these small subset of sort of core engineering intensive platforms that will then make those public goods, accelerate what everybody else is doing, and then enable um, a lot of for-profit driven innovation downstream. But, but in the example of neuroscience, I mean, there, there are those sort of several kind of core platforms. I think you could add you know, two or three others, but we're not talking like 100 neuroscience projects. And then in climate, you know, I, I, again, we sort of have like three core climate measurement problems. I think we maybe will have four or five, um, but I think that those there, there, you know, in many ways, there is so much amazing work that's going on, and the question is just if there's this structural bottleneck where a particular type of work is missing, um, then there's a lot of leverage for unlocking that. But it doesn't mean that everything needs to be that type of work. Yeah, let's get into um, BCI and and uh, neurotech and so on. Um, so a while back, you you uh, wrote this awesome paper about um, just thinking about the physical limits uh, of imaging and so on. Um, and I'm sure that you're thinking that way about um, uh, the, just the current BCIs and so on. Um, how, how, when you think about approaches, what do you think are the most promising approaches at the moment that might be able to unlock some of those kind of um, uh, gaps between kind of where the current technology is and where the physical limits are, meaning like there's room to grow there? Um, what, are the, what are the approaches that you're most excited about? There's a, there's a huge amount of room to grow. Um, and maybe, maybe to, to convey this a little bit, I, I can speculate even a little bit more than, than Millen was willing to and sort of where, where I think it's likely that like long term this this looks like. And some of that is inspired by, by although it's not identical, the case for how you do human interfacing. It's not identical to the question that we asked in the 2013 paper, which was about 
how do you do sort of com complete coverage of the mouse brain activity, but um, but it's related, right? Because basically the big problem with the mouse brain is, is this three-dimensional centimeter or so thick object. And uh, you have to basically interrogate that object, even though it's opaque, without heating it up, without destroying that object, right? So, so it's a real-time sensing of a three-dimensional um, light-sensitive and heat-sensitive um, you know, hunk of material. And, and the human brain problem is somewhat related. The skull is a slightly different thing than the tissue. But ba basically, that's this constraint of sort of three-dimensional sensing of an opaque biological object. That's, that's basically the question. And so the, the way that I think it's likely that that ultimately goes, I personally think it's very unlikely that that, that goes by physical wiring uh, being inserted ultimately. I think that that's a nice thing that you can do right now because we understand how to work with physical wires. Um, but I don't think that that scales incredibly well. And so, so I think the thing that will look like what should like look like optimally and in the long term is that you're using kind of non-invasive forms of radiation. So light, sound, magnetic fields that can penetrate through tissue. Um, and light doesn't exactly penetrate because it bounces around and scatters, but it can actually go quite a, a long distance just in a randomized way. And so the question, there's a question of what you can do with that. But so light sound and, and, and other types of non-invasive things like magnetics in combination with each other. But then the problem is neurons naturally aren't uh, coupling to those uh, modalities incredibly well. So then you need to add in the kind of transducer um, and, and DARPA in a, in a fairly recent program called as a nanotransducer. And that is the thing that couples the neurons to that form of radiation um, so that it can talk to them, right? Like optogenetics is an example. So I think there are kind of these, these couple of big areas that you would push where at the beginning, you don't directly make that BCI system that has all those things together. This is kind of the technological road mapping part um, is that you might need to make big technical pushes on some of the components. The, how do you deliver the radiation? How do you steer the radiation in this like scattering material? And then also, how do you deliver these nanotransducers, which could be done with viruses, it could be done with nanoparticles, um, it could be something else, um, but sort of gene or cell therapy, gene or cell delivery to the brain. And then, how do you do? How do you do these non-invasive modalities? And you know, initially, the non-invasive modality that you would use for some medical application without the nanotransducer might be kind of a big clunky MRI-like thing. It's not a portable consumer product that Facebook immediately wants to put in its AR glasses. It's going to use a lot of power and stuff. But then if you added the nanotransducer later, then that would make it much easier to couple to that uh, detailed information. And so, so the nanotransducer makes it easier rather than harder um, to, to get the information. But then there's are these, this other path, right? And you can't do that all necessarily in one company or one effort. Um, and so that's why I think that there's these kind of FRO-like kind of moonshotty projects um, on these kind of non-invasive uh, radiation and then uh, fundamental biological kind of delivery and access um, with things like genes and, and cells, um, not to mention the connectomics and the brain mapping and understanding how do you target uh, those those genes and cells to to circuits. Um, but so so with all that said, this is kind of why you see it. I see it parcelating into a sets of FRO like projects, but uh, each of those things to some degree has applications on their own. And so one of the ones that I think is most exciting where there is a real application is, is one that Millen just mentioned kind of in passing, which is ultrasound. Um, and so ultrasound, uh, there's a group out of Caltech that's really pushing it and a, a few other groups. But ultrasound, um, several key things about it. One is that you can create it and detect it using tiny microchips, right? These are micro -elect electromechanical systems. You can make a chip that can vibrate uh, ultrasound. It doesn't have to be a big device. You can have sort of very miniaturized delivery and sensing of the ultrasound on a chip. Um, two, ultrasound can naturally both stimulate the brain and do things like this blood-brain barrier opening um, without any genes or cells having to be part of the picture uh, that are ex exogenous. Um, and it can also see uh, brain activity at a, you know, in a way that's probably better than many of the things we're talking about, like near infrared spectroscopy or fMRI. And so the question is basically, how do you make an ultrasound platform for the brain today? Um, and the problem there is that sending ultrasound through the skull is difficult, 
um, you can do it, but it requires you to have a pretty long wavelength of ultrasound, which means your spatial precision is low. And so if you can instead put the ultrasound emitter detector array, it's chip, uh, above the brain, so not touching the brain, um, which is really good for safety, um, but uh, inside the skull, uh, then that would be uh, just from a fundamental technology platform perspective, that would be how you could use ultrasound to sort of see the whole brain at kind of intermediate resolution. And eventually you'll have things like ultrasound sensitive proteins and stuff like that, that would, or cells that would be the full interface. Um, but, but that's really powerful even now. But that's another example where, you know, it has certain applications, epilepsy and some others that are very immediate. But if you want to try to say, well, how are we going to solve depression or OCD with that? You actually kind of need the thing to be in the brain for a while and do some scientific studies to understand how those things work before you can say, here's a sure shot at the exact way we have to use ultrasound to, to stimulate that. So it's still a discovery platform kind of play, which again is not the traditional kind of um, product market fit orientation uh, where you know medical device companies basically require you to have product market fit before you start the company essentially. So. Yeah, as you as you think about maybe five, ten, fifteen, twenty years out, like what a, how do you see the field and and the tech and the and the, um, especially the devices that working at scale or the problems being solved, um, how do you see this progressing? How long how long do you think certain things are going to take? Well, I mean, it does depend, like, kind of on on what's what's happening. I mean, I think some of these ideas, like the the implantable ultrasound, semi-invasive ultrasound, have been ideas that people have been mentioning and discussing for five plus years, um, six, six, seven years. Um, I remember discussing these things in 2016. Um, and it does seem to have, a, in the current ecosystem, a pretty long time constant of that to develop, right? I think I would say that for the last six or seven years, there has been a bunch of scientific improvements in this, this sort of functional ultrasound and focus ultrasound field. But the biggest thing has honestly been bottleneck by, in my opinion, is the sort of funding and structuring of those those institutions, um, because there, there, there were proposals five or six years ago, they're not qualitatively different um, in, in scope than, than they would have been, uh, than they are now. So, um, you know, some of the other areas like the endovascular electronics going in the bloodstream, again, something we, you know, a bunch of people were talking about, there's NIH grant for that in 2014 or 2015. Um, we now have Synchron, which is a, a company that has made progress on this. Um, which is really exciting. And so they actually have something in patients. This is the thing that Milan was mentioning as, you know, was originally uh, prototyped in Australia. Um, so they've gone a kind of relatively traditional medical device path and they're having success with that. And that's, that's super exciting. But then you can imagine outfitting that with a huge amount of electronics. That thing could have a camera on it. You know, that thing could be in a research setting, talking to cells and doing all sorts of other things. And again, that kind of engineering play space or, and also the sort of clinical observational uh, human observatory type play space of how do we actually discover these applications that need the devices in the brain in order to even discover them and thus drive the markets forward. That has still been pretty slow. Um, and, you know, Neur Neuralink, I think, is getting close to doing stuff in, 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 uh, in humans. But um, again, there, there's, there's, there's sort of um, a, a relatively niche set of applications. That's the same application space you would have been talking about five years ago. So, so how do you really open that up? Well, my hope is that um, sort of DARPA-like models and FRO-like models would contribute. Um, and also that maybe you all can come up with cleverer ways of, uh, as you said, getting around the sort of short-sightedness of how valuations and value capture yeah. works in these. Because ideally, whether you call it a FRO or a DARPA program or what it is, you would have this kind of ecosystem of technology development that that is feeding into a larger roadmap or vision. And that is that is a struggle to do in, in the current ecosystem. Sometimes you even see very perverse things like a medical device company makes something much better and then you know a big, much bigger company just eats it and yeah. shelves that thing, which is the exact opposite of what's supposed to happen in terms of the long term. Um, so there can be quite perverse incentives in the short term. And then meanwhile, I see just tremendous progress in terms of the fundamental, you know, enablers of, of this stuff, um, optics and, and genetic engineering and, and so on, um, is getting much better. And there, there'll be lots of good reasons to do, to solve some of these questions like the viral delivery and cell delivery. Um, there was a, a great little article uh, online with by Jose Luis 
recon about Alzheimer's, where he just pointed out, um, you know, if you could, you basically, you, you, there, there are genes that are protective against Alzheimer's. And so if you could just have CRISPR delivery to a, a wow. large fraction of cells in the brain, that's, that's like awesome. one possible way that you could just like, you could, you could do this kind of protective thing against Alzheimer's. That will, I think that will on its own actually drive a huge amount of the molecular biology side. Um, um, yeah, and it very much agree that new financial instruments and ways of coordinating public goods funding and so on will, will really help. Um, and that is amazing about that, res that genetic that result. That's really exciting. Yeah, I'm not 100% um, sure if that will work, but that's an example course. of the kind of thing. Yeah. That, like, there is an economic driver now to to push forward uh, gene delivery in, in, into cells and, and brains. Uh, but, but, uh, and, but all of this still feels part. like, I don't know, if, um, 10, 20, 30 years um, and so on. And, and you know, when you sort of like yeah. compare it with uh, the AGI timelines that people are like thinking about and, and worrying about, you know, the, the most aggressive of those is like five, seven years. The probability mass is in the right. seven to 15 years now, which it used to be, I don't know, 25 to 30 years now, that has shrunken. And then maybe like the more conservative people in the, in the field are like still 30 to 80 years, 30 to 80 years out and so on. Um, mm -hmm. That's a very dip, huge mismatch, right? And so like we, are, we have like, was potentially transcendental technology A that like maybe totally misaligned or kind of misaligned yeah. and problematic, or even if it's not misaligned, even in the tool scenario case where like you have an AGI tool, um, that is massively destabilizing for the world, right? Like uh, potentially like um, worse in some ways. So now BCI is like from a, in a lot of the communities, like a, a uh, if you can accelerate BCI and you can get to um, some of these important results faster, then you could either get into uh, fully connecting humans with computing ahead of any kind of AGI, so then you, you sort of like level the playing field, or um, at the very least get to this kind of enhancing mode where like you have a, an exocortex or something like that, and you start like being able to use the a AI system to then kind of um, interconnect with, with, with humans and whatnot. Like, but the timelines here seem like way off. So like in, in this multiverse timeline, um, it's looking kind of bleak compared to like if we could, you know, if yeah. that was swapped. And right? if you think years neuroscience has any hope of actually contributing positively to AI safety things as well, which I think there's at least a chance that that could be the case, it's also frustrating that it's so it's so far behind in, in that way as well, because it, it is, as Millen pointed out, I mean, it's not necessarily that the human, you know, value function, you know, scales to, to super intelligence, right? But basically we have aligned a very complicated learning system along some relatively predictable, you know, we're both sitting here having this conversation, you know, I'm not just going off making paper clips or something. And so, um, you know, there, there is, there is something to be said that to be learned from the brain as well in terms of what AI could or should look like. So, um, not to mention some of these direct BCI applications, um, so yeah, it is it is a bit disturbing. I mean, it's not clear to me what's going to happen. I don't have a I have a pretty wide range of of AGI sort of both definitions and and timelines that are kind of simultaneously in my mind. But um, but it is, I mean, I think the, the one one possibility though is that like to the degree this is really true that it acts as a kind of general accelerant of lots of other things too. It's like an indirect, but people basically start to realize um, that we need to get on. <laughs> Get get serious, kind of. Um, and I would I would say even you know some of the things that DeepMind has done with protein folding, you know, that kind of comes directly out of AI is sort of very inspirational to what we're doing with FROs. Um, yeah, if, and if, if you were thinking about bio biological research as well, and yeah, if you were able to direct the I don't know research agenda of um, DeepMind or OpenAI or or uh, Anthropic or these groups where you're able to say, hey, like direct everything towards like. BCI development. What are the kinds of problems that you would solve with ML? Like what? Because uh, you know the AlphaFold was just this amazing result that just sped up chemistry and 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 bi biology it, it tremendously, right? And so that has saved um, an enormous amount of time in in, in many areas. Um, how would you sort of like direct the, these projects to then kind of orient our use of advanced AI to um, uh, speed up BCI? Yeah, I mean, I so on one hand, I actually the, the thing I take the most from from DeepMind is really organizational innovation as opposed to really fantastic AI. I mean, it, it is really for fantastic AI too, um, but it's but it's it's more the organizational innovation of of centralizing um, that research talent, being able to uh, kind of direct it towards problems. You know, AlphaFold, you know, daily stand up kind of meetings as opposed to your typical academic style of, of working. And um, so a lot of it is is 
would be applying that towards things where I, I don't think that barring uh, really extraordinary leaps in, in intelligence, you, you can get around just gathering certain kinds of data, right? So I don't think that, that AI can really help us figure out that much about uh, how to cure depression in the brain or something unless we basically have um, uh, just this data access, right? Sort of phys physical access to data. So a lot of it would be around the concept of sort of self-driving labs or kind of getting getting into closed loops with with data generation, um, where where the data quality is high enough that AI can then start to to sort of show benefit. Um, maybe potentially doing kind of closed loop hypothesis generation or or, or sort of scientific studies. Um, you could certainly imagine um, an AI in the loop you know, kind of upload C. elegans kind of type projects or sort of even small organisms. Could you do sort of very comprehensive interfacing where you're you're trying to train a model um, that recapitulates what a nervous system does. Um, but then that thing is also saying, well, here's what's the next experiment that you need to do um, to perturb that system so that we can update uh, my model of the brain. That, that would certainly be one I would push on much more as kind of modeling brains with AI, uh, modeling neural computation with AI. But, but so many of these things are gener dependent on the data generation. Um, and can you get into kind of, as again, this kind of engineering systems for data generation um, where you could reasonably get in a closed loop with AI, less so than the AI algorithm itself. Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, uh, there's hope yet. So uh, the, uh, uh, open up for questions from the audience and questions from Twitter. Uh, if you're in the live stream, uh, you can use the hashtag PL breakthroughs, and I'll be looking at that and seeing uh, questions come through. Uh, I'll start with questions from, uh, from the audience here. Raise your hand, there'll be a mic uh, coming around. Shy audience, I'll, I'll, start, with, uh, I'll start with one. Um, so, Maybe extend, if, if you think maybe ahead to um, the imaging projects and BCI further along, um, how far away do you think we're from something, some important results in being able to model full, full brains, right? So I think um, the, the, this has been a long um, trajectory of research for a lot of groups um, of being able to kind of build full neural models of uh, C. elegans and so on, and eventually it was a hope of eventually getting to a mouse and whatnot. How has the progress been in that area of things, and how far away do you think um, fully emulating a whole brain is? I think it also depends a lot on what you mean by kind of what level of emulation do you want and, and what kind of other properties does it have to have? Because uh, I think you could do a kind of FRO-esque project um, with some very small nervous systems like C. Like C. elegans. Um, in you know in, the, in a sort of five five to ten year time frame um, maybe less where uh, where you could you can imagine that the emulation then is basically just kind of GPT three on neural activity data <laughs> if that makes sense and then the question is how how valuable how useful is that to you because it it doesn't necessarily tell you um, you know how other how other nervous systems work it doesn't tell you how the cortex work it doesn't tell you how you want your BCI to interact. Um, with different parts of the brain or, 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 or how to cure diseases or so on. Um, but in terms of just could you get the, the throughput of, of and comprehensiveness of data that um, you're really capturing the relevant dimensions and then you're asking to train a model that, that, that just predicts that. Um, I don't think we're necessarily that far from it, but I'm also not sure exactly how valuable it is um, in this grander scheme. Like if we could emulate a zebrafish at that level of just kind of GPT-3-esque kind of prediction or something, a re re reasonable zebrafish uh, neural patterns or something. Let, let me bring up the diagram from um, the kind of like the different kind of models of how you might do emulation. Let's see if uh, if we could get like that in the um, live stream would be, would be great. So the, um, I'm showing a diagram here of um, the kind of, the, there's been many attempts in the past at like um, modeling out how complex would uh, different versions of, um, if you were sort of like simulate a brain and so on, if you were to approach different types of models at different layers of complexity um, and fidelity, um, how much computational power that might require. And so this is kind mm -hmm. of mapped to a human brain. Like now you could run the same experiment with um, say a mouse brain or something much less complex to get a mm -hmm. um, much, you know, very high fidelity model much sooner and so on. 
uh, which might start giving you clues as to which model might actually be the, the accurate one before you could like scale it up. Um, if you were to sort of like guess right now, like which, which of these models do you think is, is critical for, for, for brains? And of course, like this is like the massive question. Right, that yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 I I I I I I somewhat question the 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 premise of sort of this kind of di direct emulation. Like I, I think this may be k kind of semi right in terms of if you were to try to do sort of direct simulation. But but again, I, I, the way that I see this is actually like we will gain in understanding and we will gain in abstraction of models um, as we progress. Like if you had to just start now, knowing no priors essentially. Um, you know, then I think I think honestly, it would be very hard to just stop at electrophysiology, right? Because we we know there's lots of interesting things going on. You know, synapses can switch. You know, which kinds of neurotransmitter they use, or they can put things into and out of receptors. It doesn't it doesn't really but, tell you how plasticity. But let's works. start at the end and then work our way back, right? So yeah. surely, you know, if you get the stochastic behavior yeah. of single molecules, like mm. you know, you're yeah, you're in there. principle, absolutely. In, so, in principle, you you it, that's absolutely fine. I I, I think. Even What's, the where's the first one where you start saying um, maybe not? So like distributional complexes, probably yes. Mm -hmm. um, I don't quite understand what the order of metabolome and proteome and yeah, so on sure. there, but I mean, I, I think there's a decent chance that you do need what what you're calling like states of protein complexes or something like that in yeah. some meaningful way if you don't have other priors, right? But if you've actually understood something about how these circuits yeah. function, then you may realize that you only need a few states of certain protein complexes that are right. the ones that matter, right. not all of them, right? And that that can be abstracted uh, in a certain way. And so, so I see it much more as a, there's a kind of fluid um, uh, continuum between neuromorphic AI, understanding neuroscience, uploading brains. Yep. I see those as all a kind of continuum that, that basically it just has to do with the fact that we can't do any of those right now because we don't have um, anywhere near uh, comprehensiveness uh, in terms of that observation or, or sort of theories that are, are well linked to it. But um, as, as if we were actually seeing enough progress in these things, then this is not exactly the, like I, I wouldn't be too worried about the raw computation anymore. Yeah, yeah. I think you exactly. can probably do something that because you can because you know, start getting into lower. having. Um, so I guess what you're saying. Let me know if this is correct or not. Uh, you're saying for parts of the brain, you might be able to get away with some, you know, analog model or some kind of structure that you can you can um, uh, simulate in like in, in lower fidelity or still high fidelity. Yeah. You just have you know what the model is, so you can you can now yeah. start to like I mean, in, in principle, to really understand smell or something, you really have to understand olfactory receptor binding to the individual proteins and stuff like that. But if yeah. you can just kind of understand, well, we kind of have this distribution of different smell receptors. It creates yep. a certain space of a third yep. dimensionality. It's this kind of thing. Then, then we can just kind of do that, and we don't have to worry about you know small molecule binding to a olfactory receptor. There's always going to be enormous complexity, right? So I don't think that biology just cleanly parcelates yep. in terms of these abstraction layers like like perfectly. And there's like Michael Levin stuff with you know ion channels and electrical communication. There's lots there's lots of weird things, and um, you know if you look at the immune system is interacting with the brain, and that's you know small molecular fragments, and yep. it, there's there's a huge amount that's going on. But in terms of description of you know, what are the parts of this that matter for, you know, intelligent behavior or for um, what distinguishes one person from another, um, you know, functionally. Um, it's not so much that I'm worried about raw computation. I'm worried about this, like, whole line of progress of how do we understand any of this and kind of yeah. have, like, some reasonable yeah. Yeah, yeah. with priors, you know, description, of, structured description of this. Yeah. What's One of the things that's useful for, for me in this chart is mapping out to say, well, we at least have evidence of one um, model for intelligence that works at some level of computation. So then you can kind of yeah. back into, well, um, certainly it's probably not perfectly efficient and so on, especially once you get into the higher versions, the higher models are extremely inefficient. And so mm -hmm. you get to um, you know, back yeah. into, it sort of gives us a blueprint of how well we could be modeling these things, um, and and how we could like get to understand some fractions of the of the problem to be able to uh, attack those. Um, follow that approach that you suggested of like figuring out how some of these parts might work and so on. Um, yeah. Well, I, th I think machine learning is going to play a key role, and even if even in the like C elegans or or something like that, I think we'll we'll end up using like learned transfer functions of various kinds. Uh, so we don't have to know every every molecule. Yeah. Do, do you think it's it's um, uh, time for kind of like Nemo load style or you know the C elegance virtualization project scale up like be, you're doing zebra fishes and so on? I don't know. I haven't kept up with that side of things. Yeah. Potentially, I think I think that um, 
you know, it could be a great time for a small organism, a uh, very comprehensive uh, measurement uh, projects, um, you know, all the more so than it was a couple of years ago. Um, still super challenging, but uh, it's, it's, I think it's, it's not certain, but it's worth, worth ideating about whether uh, some of the challenges look more like engineering that would be amenable to this sort of FRO type model versus um, a kind of conceptual breakthroughs that, are, that are, would be needed for, for kind of small organism, um, GBT zebrafish, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, we have some questions in the audience. Thanks, thanks for this, this is great. Um, are there ways in which the brain and the computer may have kind of fundamentally different constructions where they may not be able to interface or communicate in certain aspects like, I don't know, emotions, love, things things like that? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I, 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 I think that there's a chance that some of the things the brain is structured to do, like, like don't look all that different from pretty, pretty significant elaborations on, you know, reinforcement learning, you know, neural, you know, agents that we see in AI, but, but not necessarily like so, so qualitative, like there, there's something totally fundamental about that. Like, you know, the, the, these emotions could have, you know, partly be kind of cost functions. They could partly be, st you know, state modulations of, so I, I'm not sure there's some, something fundamental there, but the thing I do worry about certainly with the kind of, if you want naive kind of stick lots of electrodes into the brain to make a BCI thing is that I think the brain does have a huge amount of substructure. So, you know, if, if you imagine um, just trying to wire up in a totally random way to a computer, you just have a kind of net of wires. Um, the brain would be even harder than that, right? Because basically, basically um, the brain has certain, you know, computers have certain types of transistors and, and capacitors and a, a few kind of canonical structures, but, you know, in some cortical circuit, let's say there might be um, well-defined kind of input signals, output signals, learning signals, attention modulation signals, other types of state modulation signals, you know, things that are meant more for like memory storage, things that are meant for more like biological kind of cleanup or homeostasis, um, other kinds of wires that are used for special purposes. And so if you just kind of wire up randomly, go, oh, we connected to some neurons. Um, that's kind of dismissing the point, right? You kind of really need, this is part of why I'm so excited about connectomics and mapping the structural molecular circuitry is like, it's kind of stupid if you're trying to put an input to something to instead, you know, are we trying to train something? Why are you hooking up to the output wire, right? You want to be hooking up to the, the cost function wire. And we don't really know a parcellation of exactly which, you know, of the sort of th thousands of different types of cells um, and how they're arranged. Um, correspond to inputs, outputs, cost functions, attention modulation, and, and so on. And if we knew that, this whole thing in some ways would be much easier um, to, to think about. Uh, so I'm, I'm very worried in a practical sense that we'll kind of oversimplify the brain as just some kind of hunk of neurons or something. But I'm less worried that there's like some fundamental thing like emotion, you know, makes it impossible to communicate. You, you could just sort of say, well, I think it's a decent model, I don't know, but a decent model might be take the most interesting you know, RL agent or something that exists in AI and say, well, how would you, how would you propose to um, intervene in its, its computations or, or read out its state? And, you know, that, that can just be like, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that, that profound. Yeah. And, and probably add it, you know, greatly depends on the fidelity level as we were seeing in that chart. Like if you pick the wrong level and you emulate too little, then you might miss uh, uh, critical comp components. So this is where you want to definitely emulate yeah. the whole way through. Um, yeah, and it, I think it's certainly dangerous to oversimplify. Um, you know, uh, you could say, well, the hippocampus is just a memory storage system, but you know, it's also very involved in emotions and you know, all that. So, yeah. Another question over there. Yeah. Uh, hi, Adam. Uh, th <clears throat> thanks a lot. So um, one. One thing that I, I would like to ask is like, how long do you think until we have like some sort of smart devices that will provide some feedback of our brain to our smartphones and well, this feedback is gonna be like, okay, you need um, to sleep more or you know, it, it will learn how our brain works and then uh, we'll provide feedbacks that actually will improve our brain activity and efficiency. 
Yeah, the thing that I find a little hard about this is like, I think there's a lot you can do just with basically behavior, right? So sort of like there's some continuum between that and just, you know, wearable computing and AR and stuff like that. And so, um, yeah, I mean, at some level, like just you see pupil dilation or just tone of voice or, or, or a huge number of other things. Um, even how you type, you know, is going to be, is, is, you know, what you say and how you type and all of that is going to be reflecting bunch of states of your brain. And so the, so the question to me is, when does a brain interface provide some kind of real comparative advantage um, and real kind of justification versus the actual difficulty of, of doing that um, relative to uh, kind of truly completely non-invasive, you know, human computer interaction stuff. And so this is why I think it's a little hard to say, well, how are, oh, maybe this field will just be driven by user interfaces. And I don't think it's quite, that simple either, right? This is actually, um, you know, that there, there are things like control labs, which works on the wrist. Um, you know, you can probably do some stuff with the brain, but there's so much that you can get without the brain for a human computer interaction purpose. Um, if you think about, you know, GPT-3 is just text, right? And you can still do so much. Um, so I don't think you need the brain and, and, and to, in the near term. And that's, that's why, um, to me, you have to kind of, it has to be kind of really qualitative improvements in the technology and in the discoveries that you make using the technology of what you can really do with it, as opposed to just this kind of consumer kind of feedback application or interface application. Would be really kind of cool if that was wrong, but I just don't see something just coming along that's just replaces the smartphone for that same use case. At least not in the short term. Yeah. Other questions? Well, uh, yeah, one more. I, I guess if maybe just a quick follow-up on my earlier one. If, if we think that the brain can be mapped uh, kind of similar to a computer, is there, does that then mean that um, we can then program a computer to, to do what humans can in the sense of like emotion and conscience and all of those things? Is that, is that a, a logical extension? Yeah, it's a pretty big question. I don't think any of that necessarily follows particularly from anything that I said. I think that's, that's something that sort of follows from kind of just where we are or where at least a lot of people are uh, in just kind of the brain sciences or cognitive science overall. Um, like in short, yes, <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, and some of it may not even require a neuroscience insight to, to functionally you know, do similar things. So. Um, yeah, because we have, you know, we're making paintings now to some degree. So, so I, I think there, there's levels of fidelity. Um, consciousness, I don't know. Um, that that I'm, I'm pretty confused about certain aspects of that. But, um, you know, writing poetry or having this conversation or whatever, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that means you could program a computer to do that in certain very weird programming uh, modality. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, I'm going to disagree with you and say that it does follow from what you said in that if you can... Um, emulate a human fully, then you have at least one way in which you make a computer yeah. that is capable of doing that. Now the question is, if you have that, once you have that as an existence proof, then can, what other approaches can you do to have that level of sophistication um, in those those kinds of models and, and so on? Um, we yeah, have an extremely yeah. complex emotions. Um, now you can do you can go approach this the other direction and say, hey, what has happened historically in this? Like, what have people made already that is similar to this? And there are a lot of both like um, kind of research experiment type things, but more more frequently games that imbue all kinds of agents and NPCs and games with significant um, emotion type behavior in the reaction and response to to stimuli in the environment, right? So you can think of many games when you're playing with characters and so on as having um, these like very basic agents that have very low, almost almost close to zero intelligence and and zero consciousness. Like definitively, they have no actual neural uh, neural structure that could ever give rise to something like that. Um, but have some, at least based on what, everything we know now. Um, uh, but they have something close to kind of um, emotional structures where you have different many different types of inputs coming together to um, uh, shift and alter like their their decision making process. Um, yeah. Now there's a deep kind of like ethical questions there of like, uh, this goes back to the chat that we were having with Nick about 
um, the ethics of digital minds in the sense of like, as you make minds of higher and higher complexity, it, it, you start qu having questions around where does exactly consciousness emerge or um, what are sort of like the ethics of um, making these systems at different degrees of complexity that might give rise to some of these emotions, right? So if in the kind of like Buddhist yeah. sense of everything is uh, samsara and, uh, uh, and suffering and so on, um, then uh, if you're not now making a bunch of agents and you imbue them with the ability to suffer, then you're like making the problem, more, problem worse. Um, and so there's like some deep ethical questions we'll have to contend with um, in, the, in the coming decades, especially as the intelligence increases. It's another reason I think for neuroscience, honestly, um, to have some role um, is what, what is actually, yeah, the key, the key circuitry of, of that, you know, um, and what's, what's the parameter space, you know, people that, you know, can, 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 uh, respond to pain, but don't feel pain, um, consciously, for example, right. These types of things. And, um, yeah, how does, how does that function? What's the, what are, what, what actually, what is, we call it, you know, pain or pain or pleasure. What is the actual set of you know, brainstem and other types of signals that are, what's the actual dimensionality of that space? We don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, uh, uh, I think one more question right there. Yeah. Uh, so this is a follow-up question, sort of to, to what was just asked. So would, uh, and this is very speculative, but uh, would, a, would an AGI in the like platonic form sense, do you think it would, display emotions or some kind of uh, human behaviors uh, as an emergent phenomenon. Uh, and in practice, if we were ever to achieve, actually get an AGI, would, uh, would it do that? Or would the human influence be so strong that it would, it's almost inevitable that it would display uh, kind of human characteristics? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know how to answer that in any full way. I mean, I, I think there are probably multi, very many different kinds of, I mean, this is also an interesting question for Nick and other people, but but um, there there are many different kinds of motivational structures or, or things that potentially you, one could give, a, give an AI. And um, I don't think we understand um, exactly what in the makeup of humans is causing these different parts of behavior, right, and, and emotion. And how much of that is really would naturally is naturally optimizing for some other end goal, right? That's it, how much of it is instrumental versus how much of that is is things that we were built in to have. And um, but I, I certainly think neuromorphic AI, uh, if in certain ways, you would expect those things. Um, but exactly what that means, what is neuromorphic AI? We don't really know. <laughs> Again, because we don't really understand how the you know what is the, the level of detail, the structure that the brain has versus learning or, or so on. Is still, uh, I think I think scientifically these things like connectomics could add a lot to understanding those things. All right. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for uh, speaking with us. It's been extremely enlightening for uh, for everyone. And uh, thanks. <laughs> uh, really looking forward to working together on a ton of these things uh, over the next years. And thanks for yeah. spending the time with us. Thanks so much for having me. All right, have a good one.